Hello, Homo sapiens. We share this planet with nine million other species. And yet here we are today, and basically every day, in an exclusively single species event. There are a few plants in the hall. For the ones watching this from home, there is probably one in your living room. But they're there more as a decoration than as a participant. So the lovely organizers of this TEDx have invited me to come and speak in the name of nine million species that are not here today. As if speaking at the TEDx event is not a challenge by itself. So you may wonder how I started representing nature in conferences. So a few years ago, I switched a scientific career in biology with the one of, um, it's called a bio-inspired innovation consultant. So basically what I do, I represent nature at engineering meetings and design tables. So I represent uh, plants and diatoms when solar cells are being discussed. And uh, insects when drones are being designed. And recently, uh, a Sahara ant when building cooling mechanism is being discussed. So for the next 15 minutes, I would like to ask you the same thing that I ask the engineers, scientists, CEOs and directors that I work with. And that is to put aside a modern world pre-assumption that only we humans, with our extraordinary intelligence and very much anthropocentric consciousness, can conceive and make complex things. And to open yourself up to a much more objective, scientific, and much more lonely idea. And that's the one that we're surrounded by at least nine million other species that are dealing with the same complex problems we are, that are solving them in a much more elegant, creative, and efficient way. So certainly, they use the intelligence that's different from our own, but that is not less powerful. So today, um, I will not speak about the solar cells and the drones. There are already many talks about that. I would like to rise the bar higher and speak about complexity and how the more things get complex, the more important it is to start working with nature. So today, our mentors will be jungles, coral reefs, forests, and lakes. And we will see how they can help us design better systems. So I'm very passionate about systems thinking, because for me, parts do not make sense unless looked at from far away and together. As a biologist, I studied social behaviors. A social behavior does not make sense if you are the only social individual in the area. You get exploited. That's not what you are aiming for. It makes sense only if a group of individuals comes together to make something that's complex and greater than themselves. Homo sapiens, you're a social species and you like to make things that are greater than yourselves. It's just that in this process, you're becoming to make more and more complex things, and you don't know how really to deal now with that complexity. Now, don't tune out on me if I've pronounced the word complex a bit too many times. This is something that concerns all of you on an everyday basis. See this? Traffic jams. When was the last time you were stuck in a traffic jam? A few hours ago, a few days ago, maximum a few weeks ago. A traffic jam is a complex system turned terribly wrong. And it's been like this for the last at least 60 years. Nothing has changed. But it does not need to continue to be so. And during this talk, 
I would like to share a message that we need to embrace this complexity, to stop simplifying it, and that nature holds the key answers in doing this right. So just to get you on track with me, a system is a, a whole made of interacting parts. So it's that simple. Although when uh, parts are numerous, it can give rise to a, uh, to, a, to a bit more complicated picture. And this is the picture of genes interaction in yeast. Oh. A forest is a system, gene interactions are a system, a cell is a system, um, a city is a system, a company is a system, uh, even a car is a system if all of its parts are taken into account. Now, at the pinnacle our, of our agricultural development, we use today seven calories of energy to, to produce and transport food up to our plate. And that's one calorie that arrives at our plate. Uh, so in the language, I don't know if uh, it's green, so of uh, apples, that would be it may take seven apples to produce one apple. And then you put that on your plate and you throw one third of it away because we are full. Well, we don't need all. I'm being very kind when I say that this is completely absurd, extremely inefficient. And yet this is what happens when we make parts and not systems. All of the global problems today are systems problems. No? I doubt that if uh, somebody was in charge of a research management system, that global change would be his plan. Huh? You'd say, we'll put all the trash in the ocean, that will make a big continent. Then the one that's left, we will burn it. We put a bit of oil, burn that, produce as much CO2 as possible, destroy the atmosphere, then that will rise the temperature, that will mel melt the South and the North Pole. Huh? What a plan. Nobody signed for that plan. We have global warming because there is no plan. In 2008, US, followed by Europe, faced financial crisis. Everybody was surprised except the biologist. So they wrote uh, an article in Nature. This is one of the most prestigious scientific journals. They called it Ecology for Bankers. And, and what they explain in the paper is that if a financial system would be looked at through the lens of a biological system, it would be a terrible one, very prone to collapse, which is what happened in 2008. And as you can see, which has been happening uh, uh, at least once per year in, uh, in, each in one country or in numerous countries for the last 30 years. This is the uh, 2008 crisis where what that uh, happened in many countries. There is a popular saying that says, the one who knows can solve the problems that the wise man would never have. Homo sapiens means the wise man. Who in this room really feels wise? All of the dysfunctions of the systems that we make comes from the fact that we make now very complex things, systems, that still function like a simple one. So that's the main message that I would like to pass on. We make complex things that function like simple one. So a simple system is um, is the ones where parts are, interact are interacting in a linear way. It is quite um, uh, simple to model and to predict its outcomes. So. Complex system, on the other hand, is the one where parts are interacting in non-linear way. It's very difficult to have the exact understanding of the whole, uh, of the whole system and then uh, very difficult to predict its outcomes as well. So what do I mean when I say a complex system, but it functions like a simple one? And as a biologist, the, most, the easiest way for me to explain this is through the concept of ecological successions. Now, this, is, this ecological succession is the process of change of number of species and their density and the way they interact over time. So we will go through this change 
uh, through this example of a volcano eruption. We are just so after volcano eruption, let's say that all of the ice is destroyed. And the first phase is a simple phase. A simple system arrives. So in this first phase, uh, the species number is low. Um, they are rather small. They have short lifespan. Think of insects, OK? Um, they produce huge amount of offspring that spreads fastly. But in that process, they focus more on the quantity of their offspring than on the quality. But that's OK. The idea is to colonize and adapt to this new area. Resources are poorly preserved, and, and the system loses a lot of its energy. But with time, they change the, um, the soil. For example, it gets more fertile, and new species start to arrive. Huh? We'll go straight away to the mature stage. In this stage, the diversity, the richness of species is high. Huh? Uh, the environment is more stable, so they can get bigger and bigger. Huh? Think here of predatory birds, of tigers. Um, they, they live longer. Um, they invest more. They have few offsprings, so there's more in the quality than on the quantity of their offsprings. They be became specialized in what they do, what they eat. Um, the resources in the system are recycled and preserved, because now there is many of us and we cannot deplete and let them leak outside. Although there are competitive interactions, positive ones are much more, uh, are more are dominant. And the system gains instability. We say it becomes a mature, complex system. Now, if I would ask, at which stage would our human systems lie today? We could say that uh, our industrial revolution had similarities with the, the simple system. You know, the idea was to propagate fast, rapid expansion. Resources were poorly preserved. And, uh, but today, this has changed. We are now a complex system, but it still functions like that simple one. So I will explain this on the example of, uh, of our food system. So as you see, this is the global food system represented as a system. So it looks like a, a web-like structure with many actors. Uh, and it gives the first impression of a complex one. But let's see how, what, what, is, what, is it, what is it really. So here we have the characteristics of uh, ecosystems when they are simple and when they are complex. And in yellow, it's the ones that correspond to our agricultural system. So we see that. Diversity of factors is quite high. Huh? There are suppliers, demanders, transporters, uh, uh, producers, stocking mar st st the ones who st st stock the, the goods. Their size are rather big, although we still have small, um, small, small pro pro producers. The growth rate is controlled. Huh? It's controlled by the supply, by the demand, by the climate. Um, and they are quite specialized in what they do. So the parts are the parts of a complex system. But how do they interact? It seems that they have, got, they, they have still uh, have the same simple interactions as 50 or 100 years ago. They, they focus more on the quantity than on the quality of the food. You can all observe that in your supermarkets. Nutrients are poorly preserved. That's why we have the catastrophic depletion of our soils. Um, most of the nutrients are not even recycled, which means that we have a huge waste problem in terms of packaging and, uh, and organic waste. Uh, symbiosis and cooperation in terms of positive interactions are rather underdeveloped and are not very much encouraged due to the competitive liberal markets, um, which leads to very low information exchange and feedback loops, and the whole system loses its stability and its efficiency, especially adaptability. So how to fix this? What nature shows us um, is that there are not many different ways for an Earth-based system to function. A coral reef and a forest may look different, but they share the same basic rules of functioning, which means that for us, there is actually only one way to do this right. And we need to, to embrace our complexity and start learning from the nature and applying these rules. 
Now, there will be space for customization. Now, as forest and uh, coral reef don't look, different, uh, look differently, our systems will look differently. Huh? But there will be closed loops, and all the nutrients will be recycled and preserved. Energy as well. We will need to, to have more positive interactions than the competitive negative ones. And we will need to focus more on quality than on quantity. Now, it seems that complexity is an intrinsic property of life. Ever since the evolution of life, it has started from a simpler form. It was always going toward more and more complex forms. And every time a major extinction event would happen, uh, complexity would, ar would rise from simpler life forms. It seems that our human systems function in the same way, from simple hunter-gatherers to first cities to the world wide web. Again, we need to start oblacing this complexity. We cannot get rid of it. So if complexity is the intrinsic property of life, why are we afraid of it? The simplest answer is our desire to control and, and have power. You see, there is no boss no, that is in charge of a complex system. There is no pyramidal organization that governs it. And as a reminder, in the pyramidal organization, the sole purpose is to focus power on that one tiny top. That's why there is one. Complexity is too complex to be managed by a committee. There is no one responsible of World Wide Web. An ant is not the boss. It's actually a slave, not to be inspired by. It. Uh, different story. And, um, and the lion does not decide for the fate of the savanna. Hmm? So to truly embrace our complexity, we need to let go of our desire to control. I'm not saying this will be easy. I'm just saying that we have no choice. Now, this whole systems thinking might seem too, still too big for a single one of you to handle. And, why, and you will think that it concerns only the CEOs and the government. Huh? So they do hold most of the power in this pyramid. But at each level, there is a smaller pyramid for which you are responsible. It may be your family, it may be your business, it may be your association. This is a complex system, and we are all responsible in transforming it, the pyramid, into a beautiful system. So to conclude, I have a message from the nine million species that were not here today. And they say to you, Homo sapiens, you are a very young species. There are trees that are older than your industrial revolution. And there are coral reefs that have nourished the oceans before you have learned how to fish. And there are even bacteria that have lived here before oxygen was available. You need to stop pretending to be wise and start learning from the ones who have succeeded. Thank you. <laughs>